I believe unity is really the Lord's own heart for the body of Christ. If you look at John 17, the night before Jesus died, he prayed that they would be one so that the world would see that the Father had sent the Son. So if Jesus prayed for unity, I believe we have done him a great dishonour by being so fragmented down through the centuries. And really there is such a blessing on unity when the body of Christ comes together in the unity of the spirit, in the bond of peace. I believe that's a God-given unity already that we must protect and cherish because that is really answering God's own prayer through Jesus the night before he died. I was just speaking to God and I was praying to him and he showed me this, this vision or a great visual on how to understand unity and what that looks like. And I saw a whole bunch of people and each person had a string that came out of them. And that string led to God, one center point. And as your relationship grows with God, as you understand things and experience things in life, you get closer to God. And if everyone is doing that, as each string goes closer to God, you get closer to that person. And so if we're truly going after Christ-likeness, if we're truly following the Holy Spirit and going after God's heart, then it is impossible for us to not get closer with people. Unity will happen because we're all going after the same thing. And that doesn't matter what kind of person you are, that doesn't matter what denomination or, or ethnic group you are, anything like that. If you're truly going after God, you will get closer with people. And I think unity is found in that place, the pursuit of God. Unity is a mark of the fact that Jesus is our Lord and Saviour that our lives individually and corporately are aligned to his priorities. Uh, it was also an answer to Jesus' prayer where he did pray that we would be one so that others would come to know the Lord Jesus through our ministry, through our work and through our witness. To that end, it's absolutely essential. The reason I think unity is so important, going back to a verse that's probably used quite often, Psalm 133, it says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So disunity is unpleasant. But the verse or the part of the verse that really gets my attention, it says, for there the Lord commands a blessing. And I think sometimes we fight for blessing, but when there's no unity, how can God bless it? And so maybe that's even a little bit of a selfish reason why unity is important. I think it's important in a larger sense as well. But when there's unity, God commands blessing on all of us. Well, Jesus prayed to his Father that the believers would be one as he and his Father were one. And it's important that we take that seriously. Uh, we need to be encouraging each other, as the scripture tells us. We need to be looking forward to the day when Christ returns and doing all we can together to advance that day and in so doing, bring honour and glory to Christ's name. Uh, we need to honour each other. We need to pray for each other. We need to support each other's work. Otherwise, we become targets for the evil one and in so doing, bring great dishonour to the name of Christ. Whether we acknowledge it or not, we are one if we're in Christ. Uh, we're placed not only into Christ, but into his body. So whether I like my neighbor or not, so to speak, I'm in that family. And so I'm simply acknowledging when we seek to do things in unity, to do that which is God has already done or is doing. My understanding, I hope my, Nathan paraphrases, if you don't have love, like what's the point of life? You know, God says everything must be motivated from love. If you're trying to achieve a goal, if you're trying to reach unity without love, it's, it's pointless. It, it can't happen. God is love. So if you're going after unity, well, there will be love. There will be, you know, Christ's character. You, you can't do it without. Both love and unity kind of are founded on a similar thing. And to me, that's respect. Uh, whether you take it between husband and wife, Love is not just an emotion or a romantic notion. It's two people who respect each other, acknowledge each other and value what God's placed in each other. And if that works in marriage, then that should work in other relationships. Uh, and we're not talking about uniformity. God has created his body to be incredibly diverse. And there's something for everybody, so to speak, in that. But where there's a respect and an acknowledgement that they too proclaim Christ, that Christ too dwells in them, that they too are his sons and daughters, I just think is a wonderful thing to do.
Oftentimes what happens is when people take their eyes off Jesus, they tend to light on other unimportant things like worldly success and finances or doctrinal issues which in the light of eternity aren't all that important. And one of my experiences having been involved in a number of different denominations uh, as well as the Anglican Church, is that we need to keep on celebrating what the other is doing rather than being critical of what the other is doing. So my personal experience, not only as a bishop but as a church planter, is that there's lots of disunity out there because people don't trust each other, because people are envious and greedy, and because sin is ever crouching at our door. And so we need to be living lives which honour Christ, celebrating our diversity, praying for each other, and pleading with the Lord for unity. I said, Lord, what is my calling now that I've finished a teaching career? What do you want me to do? And straight away, he gave me a vision of a huge pathway going from Palm Beach down to Narrabeen Bridge, which is a substantial part of Sydney called the Northern Beaches. And it was all in darkness. But as people gathered in unity in the different churches down the beaches, a huge thick sea fog rolled out to sea and the churches burst into fire. And so straight away, I knew that there was a secret here to get the churches together and pray. And I said, Lord, that's a great picture, but what do I do? He said, go to Isaiah 35, 8. And the verse was, there is a way of holiness and no wicked fool will get up on it. It is for those who walk in that way. So again, as time went on, I realized that it was to do with God's people coming, the other ones on the way of holiness, and they were to, as it were, live that holy life and gather in unity on a regular basis in the different churches, and others would be drawn in. It was all part of a, a revival strategy for where I live. And what I believe unity to be is when we're all following what the Holy Spirit has to say when he's giving a direction or he's leading us somewhere, has some type of mission or job for us to do, and we as children of God listen, follow that, that I find makes the best unity. One day I was speaking to a youth worker in our area and I said, do you have people praying for you? And he said, not that I know of. I said, you need all the churches here to be praying for you. And the Holy Spirit said to me so clearly, just do it. So the next morning I rang 20 odd churches in my area and said, we are starting to gather in unity down the beaches. Now, interestingly, out of the 20 churches, seven accepted that call to unity. And here we are nine and a half years later, we still have those regular visits to those six or seven churches each month. While living in Melbourne a number of years ago, I was invited into a number of meetings where lots of Christians from various denominations, churches had come together to work on mission projects or ministry ideas. But again and again, those meetings would descend into playground fights. When they found out each other went to church, you could see them kind of pucker up a little bit and they'd, they'd bite their tongue and then they just couldn't hold it any longer and they'd start arguing with each other. In one meeting, they found out halfway through that I was a Catholic. The meeting stopped dead. Then one guy turned to the guy running the meeting and said, what's he doing here? I thought this was just going to be Christians today. Catholics don't believe in God, they're not Christian. They had a meeting, they apologised, and the guy running the meeting asked me to leave. I was at a, a meeting about a month or two later, a different group of people working on a different project, and at this meeting, the Baptists and the Pentecostals began throwing their Bibles across the table at each other, accusing each other of not being proper Christians, but then looking to me to back them up. Uh, even when I was at university studying engineering, there was a guy who found out that I believed in Jesus, but was Catholic. And he said, well, have you ever thought about becoming Christian? I said, but I am. And he said, well, I'm sorry, you're not if you're Catholic. And he continued to try and evangelize me. It didn't matter if I answered his questions. He'd ignore my answer and just move on to the next accusation. Uh, this went on and on until one day he gave up and he just handed me the notes from his church, which was called Fight Club Evangelizing Catholics. There is still, however, uh, um, disunity, and I believe, and I'm being honest here, um, among the leadership, because um, I find that for some reason, it's the ordinary people in the churches that have caught this fire about being together. And we're so blessed when we come together in unity with the presence of God and mighty miracles and answers to prayer. 
that we're so encouraged, we want our leaders to get it. And for some reason, they don't seem to get it yet. It must be a Holy Spirit revelation. We pray for them. But I find there's really not much pastoral interest, even in, in what we're doing. Though, I must say, God is bringing new leadership into churches in our area. And praise God, the new ones seem to be very supportive of the churches being together. I remember going into a Pentecostal church in Guatemala and I made the mistake of saying I'm a Catholic missionary and he called his mate over and he actually pinned me to the ground and the two of them prayed what I think was a prayer of exorcism over me. All I can say is I guess it, I hope it worked. But the guy actually hurt me. He was, he was crushing my head. He, he pushed me to the ground and his mate was pushing me in the chest while they prayed. Once they'd finished their prayer, they stood back and just nodded their head while smiling at me as if to say, now you're a free man. Uh, no interest at all in dialoguing with me, in talking with me, in praying with me. Uh, they wanted to pray for me, but that was it. And they sent me on my way. Well, my hope is that churches and Christian leaders would in fact get together on a regular basis to get to know each other's stories and recognise how God, by His Spirit, has been working in their lives and is conforming them to the image of Christ. My hope is that local churches will get together and with their priorities aligned and their focus on Jesus, will together present an attractive, vibrant, Christ-honouring front. That's what we need. Now, the walk around the world encompassed 21 countries. I nearly lost my life about 11 times. I was held at gunpoint numerous times, knife point numerous times, beaten up, bedroom invasions, face to face a lot of dangerous animals. Uh, it wasn't for the adventure though. What had happened when I was working in youth ministry was I started to become very aware of the disunity of the church. So many Christians fighting each other, so many Christians not wanting to actually dialogue or pray for each other, but simply to preach at each other. A genuine belief that they were right and other Christians who held a different belief obviously must be wrong, but not wanting to bridge that gap. The walk around the world came about as, whether you want to call it a protest or a promotional walk for unity, to invite all Christians to pray for one, to continue Jesus' prayer from John 17, uh, that we would be one and the world would see that we are loved by God through our unity, through our love of one another. We're part of the body of Christ. and We've all got different gifts, different charisms, as it were. And so different churches and different Christian organisations will have different foci. Having said that, we need to celebrate what the other is doing. We need to pray for them. We need to financially support them where appropriate. And we always need to speak well of them. I think it must grieve his heart at times, some of the silly squabbles. But sadly, they've always been a part of the life of the church. Paul's letter to Corinthians is about a group who are, I'm of this faction and I'm of that faction, and he actually calls it immature. And hopefully, and I do see evidence of it, an increasing maturity where leaders and people acknowledge our unity in Christ, that we belong to him, we're his family. And, and I, I see great evidence of people working together respectfully and so answering Jesus' prayer. It's quite extraordinary that we have this opportunity to meet in the Great Hall in Canberra uh, at Parliament House for the National Day of Prayer and Fasting for the repentance service, because within that, at that very core, we have that first step towards unity. There are so many different areas where we are not united. We can look at it at a theological level. There are so many different areas from church to church where we do not agree with each other. But what I think actually separates so many people, not just at a church theological level, but just within families. And those relationships are the hurts. And there are so many hurts that we carry, and whether it's a grudge that we carry, or whether it's simply that we have misrepresented those around us, or we have actually taught those around us something that's not quite true. And we've almost set these walls up with one another. This is an opportunity, wonderful opportunity to step forward and to submit ourselves first and foremost to God and say, Lord, I, I ask that you would please help us. You know, we've, we've kind of broken this. Can you please help us to love one another? And by repenting to one another and being there for each other, we take that first very beautiful step in submitting humbly before God. My feeling is that we need to keep on doing these kinds of things, that a repenting, a turning away from self and turning to Christ needs to be part of our ongoing life in Christ. And so today marks, I think, a strategic and national turning point. 
And so I celebrate what's taking place today. But I think I, I need to say it needs to be just a beginning, a start. And we need to be doing these things on a regular basis at a national level like today, but also locally. And I think it'll be a very powerful thing if local churches from different denominations and other organisations who name the name of Christ can get together and pray for each other and, where appropriate, uh, repent of disunity and seek God's forgiveness. I often wonder what is the fruit or the grace that's been born from the prayers from the walk around the world. We know that God hears our prayers many, many hours, day after day, 300, no, 568 days worth while walking around the world. And I hope that those prayers, if there's the grace that's flowing, that's allowing people to repent, to draw closer to one another, to be united with those around them. Uh, I don't know if this National Day of Prayer and Fasting, the repentance service is a direct result of those prayers. I really hope that they are. I hope that those 19 months worth of prayer is actually the prayer leading up to this particular service. I feel this repentance service that we are participating in today is significant. Uh, Tom will tell whether it's historic or not, but I think it's significant in that it came together with considerable ease. I'm not suggesting there wasn't a lot of hard work being done behind the scenes, but the willingness of various leaders to cooperate, I witnessed that firsthand, the eagerness to come together, the willingness to say sorry, but also to f affirm our unity in Christ and where we have worked together. So I think while it is a repentance, Repentance is not a tragic thing. It's actually a wonderful thing. Um, Paul in Acts, forgive the little preach, but that's what I am a preacher. Paul speaks about repentance unto life. We, repentance is not just turning away from something, but turning to. And so while we repent of disunity, we turn in to embrace each other, we turn in to affirm each other, we turn in to acknowledge each other. We are actually saying, I see you and I see you in Christ. And I think that's just wonderful. We're here to heal the wounds of disunity amongst us and to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Amen. 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 You know, it wasn't uh, too long ago that here in Canberra, a uh, young woman from uh, a background in Asia where she has no Christianity at all, she's here as one of the students at one of our big universities, and I happened to meet her and she said, oh, can I talk to you for a moment? She says, I'm, I'm not a Christian, but I'm interested in it. And I've made a, because I'm very intellectual, <laughs> I've made a systematic study of it. And she said, I've gone through the, the, the scriptures and I've looked at things. She said, now this John 17, where Jesus says, praying his last prayer, may they all be one. He said, and she said, and then here in Canberra, as I walk around the streets, I see all these different Christian churches. Please explain it, will you? Because there seems to be a lot of disunity about. I'm glad she said that to me because you know what, everybody, believe it or not, we just tend to get used to it, don't we? Yes, that Christian church there, that Christian church there, there. And the idea of sort of saying that this is a scandal. This is, this is not answering the Lord Jesus' prayer, his last fervent prayer at the Last Supper, may they be one. We're divided and we're still divided. So we've got a lot of work to go, although at the same time a lot of things have happened to bring us together through the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. So first of all, I want to say to you, uh, as a Catholic Archbishop here, uh, speaking not only to my own people here in Canberra, but throughout Australia and through the miracle of the social media, as a Catholic bishop, please forgive us. I ask you quite sincerely, uh, on behalf of all the Catholics of the world, to forgive us for the times in any shape or form, any shape or form, that you felt judged by us. We say, Jesus, we've messed up. We've been looking at each other. It doesn't work. We look at you and we say, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to affirm and ask forgiveness for those that Pentecostals have spoken poorly of and at times extremely hurtfully. And I ask on their behalf for forgiveness of my brother in Christ and of all those who've been hurt by words like that. 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says, we all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. And I think if we would just allow that thought to shape our conversations, 
guide what we say to and about others, that we dare not be those that walk away puffed up, but rather walk away and say, did I do anything to build that person up? And so for every church, for every believer who proclaims Christ as Lord, I give thanks. From 2006 to 2008, I walked 15 and a half thousand kilometres around the world praying for the unity of Christians. Just walking and praying. Nearly lost my life 11 times. Again and again, church after church, I was rejected by leaders and then it was the children who would break the ice. So I'd like us to humble our hearts before God and pray, Holy Father, please unite us as one body in truth and in love for the glory of your name and for the salvation of souls. Holy Father, we pray that our unity, as we draw into unity, will be a witness of your love, will be a great tool of evangelisation. And that Jesus, as you prayed in John 17, that we would be united completely so that the world would see that we are loved by you, that indeed our love for one another and particularly of the leaders of the church would draw those outside the church into your love. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. He in whom God had placed all power and authority, John 13, verse 3, took the form of a servant and he washed his disciples' feet, including the ones who would betray him and the one who would deny him. And as a public act of love and contrition and a longing to work together in unity, my dear brother in Christ, the Archbishop, will very bravely wash my feet. Brother, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Heavenly Father, we thank You and praise You for Your example at the Last Supper. You said the greatest amongst you must be the servant of all. And then unexpectedly and with great uh, surprise, you got up and started washing the feet of your disciples, even though some said the other, that they should be washing your feet. And you said the greatest amongst you must be the least, the greatest amongst you must be the servant of all. Lord Jesus, we continue to do that now in the midst of all our frailties, our sinfulness on our feet, we ask you to wash us so that it becomes a symbol not only of our souls, but of our churches gathering together, healing in your name the wounds of division and at the same time proclaiming you as the uniter of our souls. I just want to thank you. I want to bless Sean as I have the privilege of serving him and as we've had the privilege of serving our brothers in the Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, for your mercies on our lives, that you washed our feet. And so we do this with thanksgiving in our hearts. In your precious name, we pray these things, Lord. Amen. Over here, we're set up with 12, I think it's 12 stations. Don't know if there's something prophetic about that, but that's what I was told. So there's plenty of opportunity to come and wash others' feet. But I would certainly invite Canberra leaders in the first instance, please come if you have the courage to serve one another. As we've done this together, I encourage you. It's a laying down of pride, isn't it? But God's doing a work. So Canberra leaders, Indigenous leaders, please come as God calls you to serve one another in this way. I will weep when you are weeping When you laugh, I'll laugh with you 
I will share your joy and sorrow till we sing this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we will find such harmony born of all we've known to. Of Christ's love and agony Brother, sister, let me serve you Let me be as Christ to you Pray that I may have the grace To let you be my servant I think it would have warmed the heart of God. I certainly think it was a wonderful public de demonstration of unity and a genuine exchange between the various church leaders who participated and then those who followed in, especially the, the foot washing ceremony. In the unity service there was a great feeling of um, both uh, repentance that we're not the sort of people God wants us to be at this stage because we're not fulfilling John 17 his prayer at the last separate supper that they all be one and at the same time we can see of a fulfilling at least on the journey towards that fulfillment uh, in the, uh, the the downing of prejudices uh, the increasing in education and the dispelling of ignorance the foot washing on our knees we come to the Lord asking his forgiveness uh, people who have in different denominations perhaps meeting each other for the first time. And many people came up to me afterwards uh, acknowledging uh, all sorts of grievances towards the Catholic Church for one reason or another, and then uh, at the same time forgiving me on behalf of the Catholic Church for that, and then I was able to, to do the same back. So I think that's a, a wonderful way of the Holy Spirit uh, working strongly through us by uh, forgiving, uh, by healing, and by turning us back to him rather than us looking at each other and uh, playing all sorts of church games. I had never been to one of these before. It ended quite incredibly, this utter humility of the leaders up the front to be not just washing each other's feet, but then at the end to kiss the feet of these other church leaders and to quite seriously ask for forgiveness, to beg for forgiveness, to repent, it was extraordinary. Uh, it is. It's not just a first step towards unity. It was a really solid embrace of unity. Uh, and I'm, I've got to drive all the way back to Sydney now. I've got a, a few hours ahead of me. And I think I'm going to be smiling the whole way home.